session. Uh, I'm Carmelo Bonanella. I come from OpenGeoApp. My background is in forestry, so I don't have anything to do with remote sensing, GIS, or machine learning, or whatever. I had to learn along the way. And uh, some of the terms or some of the pictures that you will see have been mentioned or uh, shown in the slides today. So I hope I won't repeat uh, most of the things that you have heard already. So we start with uh, why doing this research. So we have heard this morning about presentation on glaciers or the effect of climate change, the use of Earth observation and things like that. Uh, so I won't go too much into detail, but one of the main reasons of my research is uh, to answer these two questions. So we actually need uh, more information to anticipate and mitigate the effects of climate change. And here you can see some of the examples that the extreme uh, climatic events that are, are now happening are uh, causing on the vegetation. So you, we may have in the future some areas that will completely change uh, uh, biome or like the number of species, the distribution, uh, and this will affect, of course, in turn, agriculture, forestry, anything that we actually are uh, looking at right now. And the, the, the another problem is that even though we could have information on this, uh, we don't have information that is referenced both in space and time. So, uh, for example, like we had this example on the glaciers this morning, uh, where we're saying, okay, we have a data set with polygons, but we have some observations across the years. We don't have the whole thing covered. So it's actually a common issue of not having information referencing space and time. And then another issue is like how we can use uh, Earth observation to facilitate this. So we can see that Earth observation is actually useful to have, for example, uh, good forecasts and projections, uh, create different scenarios to which we can use then to plan. So it's useful for stakeholders, decision managers, uh, and then um, it's not just Earth observation. We have seen already this morning many examples of how Earth observation combined with machine learning which basically are mostly data-driven models uh, instead of uh, process-based models, uh, can be used to actually create uh, reliable scenarios uh, that then can be used uh, to <clears throat> forecast into the future. And uh, I won't stay too much in this general uh, part of the topic. I'm at the beginning of my third year, so I already have some results that I can show. And, and I would just analyze these two case studies. One is just about monitoring, and the other one is about uh, combining the information that we had for future projections. So the first one is about uh, tree species distribution in Europe. Here is a bit of the state of the art that we have. Uh, these are all publications that are produced by the GRC, so they actually are harmonized already at a European level. Uh, you can see some of the data sets that we have, for example, with data points or uh, polygons, observations on distribution of species in Europe. And on top of that, we already have some um, atlas that shows for the forestry species what's the uh, potential distribution of these species across Europe. But all this information, they are uh, very broad. So, for example, we have just shape files uh, that just cover, at, uh, or rasterize, they go at 10 kilometer resolution. They are not referenced in time. So we don't really know what's going on with the three species. So what we did uh, was to use machine learning, earth observation, data points publicly available, everything is completely open to produce potential and realized distribution of 16 forestry species for Europe across different uh, time steps. Uh, these, are, these maps are all available on our stack portal on the EcoData Cube, so you can actually visualize and see everything that you want on these maps. They're all at 30 meter resolution. So as I said, we solved, let's say, the high resolution problem uh, we provide not only probability, but also certainty maps. So if you as a user uh, would like to use these maps for operational planning, we actually provide an additional layer that shows uh, what is the uncertainty for the prediction in that pixel. Uh, so you can actually, like the decision is on the user to decide if the prediction is reliable or not for his own use case. And the publication for this is available, so you can, lay, you can read all the modeling steps, all the data that we used. Uh, in the publication, you also have links on the repositories with the code and the data. Um, and basically, some of the main results are that the Landsat data that we used, the Landsat uh, collection that was analyzed by Leandro in uh, the, his presentation on the EcoData Cube, is actually the one that uh, maximizes the predictive performances of our model. 
And the, the models that we have, uh, although very accurate for some species, uh, cannot be used for inferring causation, but just correlation. Um, for in the second case, instead, for is for the future projections I was mentioning. So we have this uh, projection into the future of the distribution of biomes. So we use different uh, classes. So you can see that the one above is a 20 classes classification system, and the second one it has uh, an aggregation to six classes. And um, we actually got different uh, climatic scenarios here. So we analyze it in the 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5 climatic scenarios. And each one of those has a worst case scenario or a more optimistic case scenario. Uh, you can see that the, all these uh, Sankey plots here on the left show the percentages of changing in classes uh, in different scenarios. So um, in, for example, for the 8.5 scenario, you can already see that most of the areas that are covered in uh, savannas or, for example, in thunder will change, while instead the more conservative scenario, the 2.6, uh, just shows very few uh, changes. Here, instead, on the map on the uh, right, you can actually see all the areas uh, in yellow uh, that all the three climatic uh, uh, models actually agree that there's going to be a change. So no matter what kind of climatic projection we will have into the future, those are areas that will have a, a change anyway. Uh, so these are actually important information to consider when planning for the future, because we highlight the areas that will change into the future. And these areas are already filtered with our uncertainty layers. So it's not like just the output of the projection. These are all areas that have a threshold of uh, safety for more than 50%. Uh, and these are calculated on the probability spectrum. So 50% in probability around six classes is actually a big uh, conservative threshold. Um, some of the results that we also got from this model is that uh, those are the two main trends that I was talking about. So we have a retreat in the polar biome in favor of the boreal forest, and also a retreat of the tropical rainforest biome in favor of the savanna regions. Uh, so what is important from this paper is that we not only doubled the accuracy of previous studies from uh, Tom uh, from a couple of years ago that uses the same classification system, uh, but also we used half of the covariates, so it was just climatic uh, covariates, that then allowed us to uh, simplify the assumption for the future projections of the models. Um, so even though I showed in the map that there were some areas of change, uh, it's still very small shifts considering the conservative threshold, so it's below uh, actually 1% of the Earth's surface. Uh, and it would be really important if uh, decision makers and stakeholders would like to uh, use and take into consideration these maps to identify areas that are going to change into the future. So that's a bit of an overview of my research. The future uh, steps would be to combine these two approaches. So for example, doing future projections on the three species. But that's about it. So if you have any questions, please. Time to ask. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carmelo. Uh, maybe we can take one quick question. Yes, Bob? In the prediction part about the competition of different biomes, what mm -hmm. is the mechanistic model that he used? Uh, we use an ensemble model. It's very similar to the model that uh, Leandro shown. So we use uh, an ensemble model based on random forest, gradient boosted trees, and uh, generalized linear model. Then we combine the predictions using a uh, staked regularization approach. So we use cross-validation and we take just the out-of-fold prediction of each of the three models to train an additional model that's based on logistic regression. And then from that, we get the output of the results. Mm. So the final ensemble model gives us also which of these three models has the highest uh, importance. And then from the variable importance of each of the models, we actually get which of the predictor variables have the highest importance in getting uh, the accuracy of the yeah. model. Can you run the model backwards to predict uh, what was it 50 years ago? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, we actually run everything from 2000 to 2020. So we have the mm -hmm. whole time series. Okay. So we hope that if we have also the previous data, we are now acquiring the Landsat collection that was before the 2000, uh, we could also run it backwards, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we will have a nice drink se session afterwards, so you can continue with that. Okay, Carmelo, thank yeah. you very much for your presentation.